This morning I saw some raccoon tracks up on the pad at the top of the hill. It was in a part of the pad that I had swept the night before. It was because I had swept the area that I could actually perceive the raccoon tracks in both senses of the word perceive. One is see that they were there, and two, be able to identify them. The Taijans like to use this as an analogy. You sweep the monastery, get everything clean, so you can detect what's coming, what's going in the monastery, in the same way that you try to sweep your mind clean. You should develop your mindfulness and your concentration, get the mind still, so that you can perceive things arising in the mind. If greed comes, you want to be able to perceive it very early on. Lust comes, you want to perceive it very early on, any unskillful emotion. If the mind is quiet, you can perceive it. Now, as I said, the two senses of the word in English, to see something and to identify it, those are actually two separate words in Pali. The first, simply acknowledging the presence of something, that would be an act of vijnana, consciousness, you cognize it. The perceiving is identifying. Of course, it's more than just having the pad swept that allowed me to identify those tracks. I had to remember these are the characteristics of these kinds of tracks. These kinds of tracks, these are raccoon tracks. Some people limit the word perception simply to memory, but there's more going on. You're able to identify something right in front of you. It is based on memory. You remember certain characteristics, mean this, mean that. But then you apply it right here, right now. We see this in the Vinaya. A lot of the offenses are defined by how you perceive the object that you get involved with. For instance, if you touch a woman, you have lustful intent in doing it, and you perceive that she is a woman, okay, the offense is one thing. If you perceived her as something else, as a man, as a mannequin, then the offense would be much less. And as you live by the rules and get to think of your actions in terms of the rules, you see that they emphasize this role of perception, how you identify what you're dealing with, and how important it is to get your perceptions right. There was a case of a monk who, seeing a pile of clothes, on a chair, thought there was just a pile of clothes, perceived it just as a pile of clothes, and sat down very forcefully on top of it. But it turned out there was a baby child inside that wrapping of clothes, and the child died. In this case, the Buddha said, before you sit down, always make sure what you're sitting down on. In other words, check your perceptions to make sure they're right. Because it's not simply a matter of figuring out what there is around you, but also thinking about the meaning or value of what's around you. You find this in the Thai definition of the word sanya, jamdai mairu. Jamdai means to recognize something or remember something. Mai means, what does it mean? In the case of the footprints on the pad. The fact that it was a raccoon meant nothing much, just to, we have to be careful. Raccoons can steal things, but they're no real big danger. However, if there were grizzly bear tracks or wolverine tracks, that would be something else. We'd have to live in a different way because there are more dangerous animals around. And it's in this element of what the perception means, or how you perceive the value of something. That's why perception plays such a huge role in the practice. Another teaching from the Ajans is that when you focus on the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness, you can start out with any one. For instance, you can focus on the body, analyze your attachment to the body. 
and it'll start spreading around to feelings and perceptions and fabrications and consciousness as well. In fact, it, what's important is how it goes to your perceptions. You look at how contemplation of the body goes. It's all a matter of learning how to perceive it as not worthy of attachment. We come in with the perception that it is worthy of attachment. We correctly identify it, we know it's a body, but we have a wrong perception about its meaning and about its value. So we contemplate the parts of the body, we contemplate the drawbacks of the body in terms of its many illnesses. We learn to develop the perception of its being an inconstant, stressful, not self, unattractive. To change our idea about its value, because it's through the value that we get attached to it. If you learn to perceive it as having not much value at all, at least not much value in terms of how our lust might want to value it, or how our pride might want to value it. Then the attachment goes away. The body does have value as something we can use in the practice. So you take care of it just enough to keep it going. You can continue your practice with relatively good health. That's a correct evaluation for the body. But to get there requires that you strip away a lot of your other wrong evaluations. The same goes with feeling. We're sitting here, sometimes we deal with feelings of pain. And as long as you identify the pain, perceive the pain as being the same thing as the part of the body in which it's located, it's going to be very difficult to not suffer from it. Your perception is what creates the bridge between the physical pain and your mental pain. It's one of the instructions in dealing with physical pain. It's asking yourself, well, is the physical pain the same thing as the body? Well, the body, of course, is the four elements. Pain is something else. And we've glommed the two together. So how do you unglom them? One way is to ask yourself, where is the sharpest point of the pain right now? And instead of running away from the pain, go toward it. Be proactive. You'll see that that sharpest point moves around. You keep following it around and around and around. And the, there's this weird sense, I guess, the pain does separate out from the body. It's almost as if they're no longer in the same place anymore. And when you separate them out, sometimes the pain stays there, and other times it disappears. What's really weird is that sometimes it slips into your heart and disappears, which shows how much a role the perception plays in your experience of the pain. So no matter which of the aggregates you focus on, it always seems to come down to perception. And that perception of value, the perception of meaning. This, of course, relates to Venerable Sariputta's answer to that question. When you go to a foreign land and intelligent people ask you, what does the Buddha teach? His first answer was he teaches the end of passion, the end of desire. And if they're intelligent, they'll then ask passion and desire for what? He says, the five aggregates. Why is that? Because if you have passion for these things, then when they change, you're going to suffer. If you don't have passion for them, then no matter how much they change, you're not going to suffer. So he's boiling the Buddhist teachings down to a value judgment, which of course is an issue of perception. If you see these activities, and they are activities, the aggregates are not things, they are activities. If you see them as worthy of pursuing, you're not going to let go, you're going to keep doing them again and again. But when you begin to see that they don't provide the happiness that you want, and particularly when you learn about, about the happiness that can come when you let go, which is what the Third Noble Truth is all about, 
then you see they're not worth it. And you don't have to suffer from them anymore. So it's a matter of training your perceptions. It's a matter of training your perceptions, not only to identify okay, what is an aggregate, but secondly, what are they worth? This is what the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and that self are all about. To call into question the worth of these things, the meaning that you gave to them. And when you can let go of them, then you're open to something that's even greater than you can imagine, in which there is no perception, but there is the greatest happiness possible. So perception plays a huge role in the practice, both in identifying what's what and learning to retrain your perceptions of value and meaning about what's what. If you focus here, you find that you can accomplish a lot in freeing the mind from its attachments, which are based on perceptions, mistaken perceptions. In developing perceptions that allow you to let go. Of course, eventually you have to let go of all perceptions, because they too are aggregates. But that's simply a part of the strategic approach that the Buddha takes. You use the aggregates to get beyond the aggregates, then you let them go. When I was teaching in Canada last November, one of the people at the retreat was saying that she had been told that we cannot change our perceptions, which is probably one of the most un-Buddhist teachings you can imagine. It's because we can change our perceptions. Learn how to identify the world in a new way. Learn how to identify its value in a new way. That the whole idea of learning the teachings, practicing the teachings, makes sense. It's because we can change our perceptions that we can be free. <laughs>